Good evening. If you would, grab a Bible. Let's turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts 16 is where we'll be centering our time of study tonight. And it will help you to understand and follow along with what we're going to talk about tonight to have Acts chapter 16 open in front of you. Appreciate so much your presence here tonight and the things that it says about you and your priorities, your desire to have an interest in the things of God, to learn more about God's things, to honor God. And uh, it is an encouragement to me. And most of all, though, it says something about the God of heaven who has blessed us so richly and has now revealed himself to us through the Bible. I do need to say um, it is humbling to have a thing said about you like what Brother Ben has said about me and uh, my rough edges and uh, the things that, uh, that you guys know about me. There is someone here tonight who heard my very, very, very first sermon uh, when I was 16 years old that uh, I, I got up and preached on a Sunday night and uh, it was such a generous uh, willingness of that congregation to have me uh, to speak. And, and I went through my extensive notes and I got done with all that I had to say and I, I turned my notes back over and went back over it and finally I said, guys, that's all I've got, seven minutes, <laughs> seven minutes. However, I got new batteries in this microphone tonight. We're going to go a little longer than seven minutes. I think we have eight hours or so on these batteries tonight. No, uh, I, somewhere between seven minutes and eight hours is what I'm shooting for tonight. But for those who have heard uh, those lessons, I am particularly grateful that you are willing to show up tonight. Uh, but it is good and encouraging uh, to see the growth that happens as we try to pursue God's things. All of us are growing and all of us are changing. Hopefully that's in the direction of good things and in growing toward the image of Christ. Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. Acts 16, 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What makes people change? This jailer goes to work like it's any other day. And yet this day, everything will change forever. This is a day that will be filled with earthquakes and maybe a little bit of job insecurity and a suicide attempt and his whole family changing forever. This day will always stick out to the jailer for the rest of his life. Something changes. The gospel is a message of change. It is a message that says Jesus is king. He has come to earth to establish that reign. And you and I, as we submit to that king, as we follow him, we have hope of being a part of his kingdom and someday living with him forever and eternity. And that hope brings change now in hopes of future change. But have you ever wondered why some people change and others don't? Or when they hear that same life-changing message, some respond with a shrug and some fall down trembling. What must I do to be saved? There are some people who respond quickly and some people it takes a long time. There are some people who study and reason things out. And there are other people who are deeply emotional and come trembling and crying. What must I do? Or maybe I should just ask, think about yourself. Haven't you ever had a change in your life that you knew you needed to make? And yet you resisted and you waited. And you knew somewhere deep in your heart, I should do something different. But something held you back. What finally took you over the hump? What made you change? Malcolm Gladwell popularized the phrase, the tipping point. And he used that phrase, the tipping point, to talk about the moment in which a movement gains momentum and suddenly it becomes more than it is. Sort of like the snowball that begins to roll and the momentum only grows. He describes it as the moment of critical mass, the threshold, the boiling point. And I want to think about the tipping point, not because I'm interested in Malcolm Gladwell. I'm interested in how do we reach that point where suddenly we tip 
and we begin to fall in the direction of change. So I want us to think about this story about how a jailer woke up one day and went to bed that day completely changed. And think about how you and I change and how the people in our lives change for a few minutes tonight. Now, this story takes place at the end of a long day for Paul and Cyrus, Silas. Paul and Silas have come to the city of Philippi in Macedonia because they have had a dream. Paul has a dream of a Macedonian man saying, come over and help us. And so he is obedient to the dream. They come over to Philippi in the region of Macedonia. But honestly, it doesn't go so well. There's no synagogue in Philippi, and so they are reduced to going to preach among a small gathering of women at the river who are there to pray. Now, God blesses that meeting, and they meet Lydia there, and Lydia obeys the gospel. And so there is some entry for the gospel in Philippi. And yet, there doesn't seem to be the large conversion story in Philippi that we've come to expect when Paul goes to a town, especially if you're going to a town because you were, you were invited in a dream. And so Paul and Silas are walking around the city of Philippi and they are followed day after day by a woman, a young girl, a slave girl with a spirit of divination, some kind of demon that enables her to know some things. And she keeps saying, these men are servants of the most high God. I love how the text in verse 18 of this chapter says that Paul was greatly annoyed. And so he decides to cast out her demon. Greatly annoyed is one of those beautiful Bible understatements that says, Paul was sick of this, and he finally did something about it. Well, because he has cast the demon out of this girl, her owners become angry because she is the source of their livelihood, and so they begin to cause legal trouble for Paul and Silas. In verse 20 of Acts 16, it says, when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. So notice those accusations the accusation of advocating customs that are not lawful for us, and also the accusation that they are disturbing our city. Those may be the only things this jailer knows about Paul and Silas. These are what everyone is saying they are doing. Verse 22, the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows, Upon them. They threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So they are stripped, they are severely beaten, and then they are jailed. And the jailer receives them. This is where the jailer enters the story, and he keeps them in the inner prison. So, what makes this jailer change, and what makes this story go forward? I don't have a clicker tonight, so I'm asking, I guess the guys in the back, can we move forward? There we go. And one more. And one more. First of all, what makes people change is that circumstances shift. Circumstances shift. Now, verse 24, you have the jailer. It says, receive this order. He put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. He is just doing his job. This is his job. Every day he gets prisoners. He puts them there. He locks them up. And when their time is up, he takes them out. This is what he does. This is his job. He puts them, though, notice, in the maximum security wing of his prison, the inner prison inside and he fastens their feet in stocks which is both a security measure because now they can't get out but also it was intended to make them uncomfortable and be a part of the punishment so he is doing what he is told to do but paul and silas are being treated as if they're hardened criminals verse 25 verse 25 about midnight paul and silas were praying and singing hymns to god and the prisoners were listening to them somehow after this horrible day after being stripped and beaten Paul and Silas are singing and praying at midnight. Now, there is some evidence that the way these jails might have worked, it might have been that at night, all the prisoners were brought into the same room so that they can all be accounted for, locked in together, and the jailer can leave them and go home. So there's a more secure, safer room that they're put in at night. And the jailer, as I'm going to suggest to you, may have a house that's adjoining the prison, nearby, close enough to hear everything that's going on, but he doesn't have to stay there in the prison all night. So what happens is in verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Which by the way, let me suggest to you that that's a very specific kind of earthquake that specifically unlocks everyone's bonds. Oh, thank you, brother. 
All right, so verse 27, when, his jailer, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. So this earthquake happens, and the jailer who, in my assumption, is adjoining the jail, he is woken up by the earthquake, and his first thought is, oh no, better go check on the prisoners. And so he goes, and the first thing he sees is all the doors open. Okay, this is his nightmare. All the doors are open, and so he draws his sword, and he is about to kill himself. Because if prisoners escape on his watch, he has failed in his job. It is considered noble to go ahead and take his own life. But consider what's going through this man's head at this moment. His life is over. It's his worst nightmare. He has failed his country, and he has let criminals go free. So how would you like to wake up to that? He draws his sword to kill himself. His mind is in a little bit of a different place than it was just a few hours ago when he received Paul in silence. So, verse 28, Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So Paul says, hey, everybody's here, which I think he knew that because I think they were all in the same room. But he says, this is all okay. And the man then decides to rush in and fall down trembling and asks them, what must I do to be saved? It is a tremendous shift from where we were. From putting bloody prisoners into the stocks to trembling, falling down and asking those same prisoners, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He is in a different place. But may I suggest to you, it is not because he has heard tons and tons of gospel sermons. This jailer is not someone that Paul has just been working with for a couple of years and he's finally come to his senses. What has changed with this jailer? We all know what it is. There's been an earthquake. There's been a near suicide. This man's life has flashed before his eyes and he is different than he was just a moment ago. He's ready to hear. The prodigal son is like this. So the prodigal son is that one who takes his dad's money and he goes off to the far country and he wastes it. And he is not at that moment terribly interested in the implications of what it means to waste his dad's money. He's just having fun until something changes. Well, this is, this is not working. Go forward for me. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. Do you notice how we get to I will arise and go to my father? First of all, he had spent everything, and a severe famine arose. Things changed. A severe famine means it's a lot harder to get food. Of course, he hires himself out to feed pigs and he begins to be in need and no one gave him anything. And then he comes to himself when he is hungry, when his circumstances change. Sometimes we need circumstances to hit us upside the head so that we come to ourselves. So we wake up because sometimes we become so wealthy or we become so complacent or we become so content in the relationships and situations we are in that we don't even consider whether we might need to do something about our relationship with God. And so until those circumstances change, we're just floating. We feel we're fine. Let's try this one. All right. Yeah, all right. Please hear me. I am not saying that we can't make a change until our circumstances change. That is not what I'm saying. Here is what I am saying. I am saying that often change doesn't feel urgent until circumstances make them urgent. Then we say, oh, now I see how far I've fallen. My father's servants have more than enough bread and here I perish with hunger. Suddenly we see with crystal clarity. Have you noticed that shift? When I think about this, I think about the shift in Belshazzar the king in Babylon, who is toasting with the goblets from the temple. And they're having a big party and everyone's celebrating. And then suddenly he sees a disembodied hand writing on the wall and it says his knees knocked together. That's a change. Circumstances change. Now, it doesn't always mean that people make good choices when circumstances change, but it does mean that we're a lot 
readier to listen. And so it is with this jailer. Circumstances shifting seems to puncture our pride. It seems to say, maybe I don't have it all figured out. Maybe there's more that I need to consider. And I see my need again. And I'm more open in that moment to God and more open to change. So let me say that this way. When you know someone who is resistant to the gospel and you get frustrated about that and you get discouraged, remember, things can change. And I don't just mean a person changing. I also mean circumstances can change and create a totally different tone for that person. In fact, I would go so far as to say that there are little personal earthquakes that are going on in the lives of people all around us. You have people that you know who are going through marriages that are falling apart. People who are losing jobs. People who are battling sickness. People who are falling apart mentally. And those are moments that are openings. They're openings, yes, to show that we care about people, to be there for them, to pray for them, to work with them, to help them but they are also moments that are openings for the gospel. Because now in that moment, they are like the jailer. They are ready to consider things they had not thought about before. They have priorities that are suddenly very different than what they thought they were. So think first about people changing by circumstances shifting. Second, what makes people change is that needs emerge. You see, when we see Uh, When we get knocked off balance, we start to see things differently. We see life differently because this jailer went to work today not expecting to kill himself. And yet suddenly things change for him and different sets of needs emerge. More than just I'm going through a regular day. It's just like any other day. I'm doing my job today. Today is different. And I realize maybe there's more I need than what I realized before. Verse 27. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. There is incredible inner turmoil in that verse. The panicked look on this man's face as he enters and he sees it. And then to hear that voice from Paul that says, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Imagine how you would feel. Suddenly, this man begins to think about What's going to happen to my wife and my children when I'm gone? He begins to think about, did I do all the things I wanted to do, needed to do, should have done? He begins to think about, have I wasted my life? Didn't I think there would be more time? He's thinking on a different wavelength than he was just a moment before. And so he rushes in in verse 29. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then they brought him out. He brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Saved. We'll talk more about what he means by that in just a moment. But in this moment, this man sees how much he has to lose. He has a job to lose. Yes, he has a family to lose. Yes, he has a life he can lose. He is thinking on a different level. And I want to suggest to you that very often people change because they begin to see their need in a different way. And they begin to realize, I'm not going to be happy until I deal with the needs I have. That is exactly what happens with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and it says, the young man said to him, all these things, Jesus says, you know, keep the commandments, you'll be fine, kind of brushes him off. And he says, hey, all these things I've kept, what do I still lack? Matthew 19 and verse 20. What what is missing? The man knows something is missing. And he comes to Jesus to say, help me figure out what the missing thing is. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, he doesn't do much with the answer. I understand that. I'm not saying everyone who ever understands their needs responds well. But I am saying when needs emerge, we start operating on a different level. For the jailer, matters that seemed intellectual before are suddenly very real and very emotional and very urgent. He rushes in trembling. He wonders, who are these guys who are in my jail? What do they think? What do they know? And maybe he even starts putting it together about Paul and Silas. You know, they're accused of preaching a bad message. They're singing songs to God in the dark. 
They seem to have kept the prisoners in somehow and saved my life. And now they have called out to make sure they saved my life. Maybe he starts to put it together. But one way or another, he is in a different place because he is realizing his need. Now, I can tell you that you need something. But until you feel it and you embrace it and you believe it, it is extremely unlikely that you're going to change. You must know, yes, that is a need I have. So let me just say that when there are people in our lives that we want to help to change, to follow the Lord, we need to be helping them identify their need. People express things to us all the time that are echoes of the need they have for the Lord Jesus. Maybe they don't realize it. Maybe they don't realize that the frustration they have with their family, that the disappointment they have with their lives, that the way they feel frustrated with their friends who are living a wild life, whatever it is, there are things they are saying that are deep needs of their hearts and they don't realize what they're really seeking is Jesus. But you know what we do? And it is our privilege to help them connect that need to the need that they might not even realize they have. So how do people change? They change by needs emerging. Then you have answers that are sought. Look in verse 29 with me. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He goes to them with a purpose. He has a burning question to ask them. When we seek answers, we seek answers to questions that are peculiarly personal. Each one of us has something different that we find challenging about the gospel and something different that we find appealing about the gospel. It touches each one of us in a different way. If I was to speak tonight about what is challenging to me about following Jesus and what is appealing to me about following Jesus, you might say, I see some of that, but that's not really what I think. And so it is with all people. It is doubtful, though, that anyone had preached to the jailer a sermon entitled, when you almost lose your job and almost lose your life, what you really need is Jesus. It'd be a great sermon, but I don't think they preached it. Instead, he comes simply asking, what must I do to be saved? Sometimes it's hard to address all the different kinds of questions someone might have in a mass sermon. I look at a group like our group in this building tonight. And, and this group is going to have questions and concerns and objections to things that I say that I can't possibly anticipate. Even in the New Testament, you have this. When John the Baptist preaches, some groups come to him and they say, well, what do we need to do? The tax collectors say, what do we need to do? The soldiers say, what do we need to do? And he gives them different answers because there are different answers for each one. But when we reach the tipping point, we start asking our questions in earnest. And those questions are very specific. Like that rich young ruler, we start asking, well, what, what am I missing? What do I need to do? What else is there? What does repentance mean for me? And when we ask those things in earnest, we are, we are trembling and we're falling down and we are ready to listen. That's how change happens. So it is one thing for me to say, we need to overcome pornography. It is something entirely different for someone to say, I have had enough. I've been down this road and I've tried to beat it and I've tried to quit it and I've tried different software and I've tried accountability and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. What do I need to do? And suddenly there is a question that is a burning question. It is a question born of desperation. It's a question that says, I'm at the end of my rope. Help me. That's the jailer. That's how change happens. Or maybe someone says, you know, we're going to lose our house. And over and over again, I have tried to fight just being in constant debt. And no matter what I do, we cannot stop our spending. And I've tried this and I've tried this and I'm finally, I just at the end of my rope, how do I beat this? And the questions are urgent. How do I save my marriage? We've tried everything and I am desperate. How do I overcome this addiction? 
I hope you hear in those questions. We're way past casual. This is not intellectual, where we sit back and we debate. Oh, well, what do you think? Or what do you think? No, these are burning questions. I need to do something, and I need to do it now. What must I do? Now, when the jailer comes and asks the question, what must I do to be saved? I am deeply curious about what he is asking. Because saved can have a lot of meanings. And we're not exactly sure how much the jailer knows as he asks this question. I suspect, this is just my opinion, I suspect that he fears that whatever God has caused this earthquake is unhappy with him. And he wants to know, how do I pacify that God? Here are some guys who seem to know something about God's. How can I spare myself? What that says to me is that sometimes we don't even know the real depth of our needs and the questions that we're asking. But there's something else here. If we're talking about seeking answers, why did the jailer go to Paul and Silas? Why them? Why go to prisoners? I mean, is that typically what we think of as the first place to go when we have a spiritual question? It seems to me. It's hard to know exactly what this man knew about Paul and Silas. He knew the accusations against them. Probably he had heard their prayers and songs at midnight. He knew Paul's concern for saving him and for saving the other prisoners. He knew about all of that. But surely this jailer had seen tons of prisoners. Surely some of those prisoners had said, I'm really innocent. I don't deserve to be here. They had objected to their treatment. Probably some of those prisoners he had known over the years had, had said, you know what, I, I deserve what I'm getting. But how could anybody be joyful? What subset of prisoners is there that's excited to be there? Who would that be? What happens in this text is that Paul and Silas's reaction earns them an audience. He is ready to listen because he has seen something unique in them. And I want to tell you, if they spent the night bemoaning their treatment, talking about their rights and how their rights have been violated, no Roman should have to go through what we're going through. I'm going to have somebody's job in the morning. Would the jailer have come to them? If they're not singing songs, if they're not joyful in suffering. Now, the question that should raise for us is how is our reaction to adverse circumstances earning us an audience with the world? What do people see when they look at me going through a hard time? And if all they see in me is someone who bemoans and complains every slight inconvenience, and all they see in me is someone who just always asserts his rights about everything and insists I must be treated in the way that I prefer, in what way will they say, I want to go talk to Jacob because he is certainly different from the world. One of the most powerful things that you and I can do is to position ourselves so that when someone is ready to ask questions, they know who to ask. When someone is ready to change, they know that person is not only a person who might know the answer, they are a person who has a spirit that is different. And so when answers are offered, they come because the questions have sprung from an audience that's been earned. And then lives change. Look with me in the rest of the story. In verse 30, in verse 30, it says, then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. What the man needs is Jesus. But he doesn't know the first thing about Jesus. So what does Paul do? He preaches about Jesus to him and his household. Now things are already changing. I don't know if you're following what's happening in the text. In verse 30, it says he brought them out. That means he took them out of jail. He brought them out and he brings them into his house. Now, I'm pretty sure I don't know all the rules for what it would be like to be a jailer, but I know at least one of the rules is don't bring the prisoners into your house. Here they are. Brings them into their house, has them talk to, their fam has them talk to his family. 
And verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then off they go to a place where there is water. In verse 33, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Now they have been sitting in the inner jail with bloody wounds all day long. The last we saw any description of their clothes, they were stripped. And this man washes their wounds. He is undoing what has been done to them. And part of that he had done. He was certainly a part of the system that had done this wrong to Paul and Silas. And so in some way, something is changing here, isn't it? He is certainly changed in his spirit toward Paul and Silas. And then at the end of verse 33, it says, And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. He and all his family baptized right then, same hour of the night. Do you know why? It would be a mistake to wait when the iron is hot. This man, he knows, I nearly died tonight. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. I believe it. There's some water. Why don't we do this? And so he and all his household are baptized the same hour of the night. I love trying to find time in the story. Who knows what time it is? I mean, it was midnight when the earthquake happened. I wonder what time it is because you know what they do? They have a meal. Do you ever have a meal like that? One of the things I love most about preaching the gospel is when somebody calls me and it's midnight or it's 2 a.m. and they say, I need to be baptized now. And so, you know, you get up and maybe try to do something with your hair and you rush off to the building and then everyone is so excited. Sometimes you'll just say, yeah, let's, let's go get something to eat. Is there anywhere open? There is something about that moment that is so beautiful and so pure that we want to share it and we want to rejoice together. It says that he rejoiced having believed in God with his whole household. Now, there are still decisions to make for this man. He's going to have to decide how he's going to lead his family, what being a Christian is going to mean going forward. What are we going to do? What does worship look like? I'm sure he had a million questions, but everything has changed in one night. Now, it is my belief that the jailer's story is sort of a shortened version of one way people change. Now, it's not the only way people change, but it is a way when people suddenly, due to circumstances or to people or to information that they receive, they shift and they listen and they respond and they change right then. And I want to tell you that God has a knack for this, that when people are ready, he puts his people in place to help. So that you have Paul and Silas just happening to be in the right jail, the right night, at the right time, and suddenly they are ready to teach this man the gospel and baptize him and his entire household. God has a knack for putting Philip on the road to Gaza to overtake this chariot where this man just happens to be reading, isn't it convenient, Isaiah 53, and asking, oh, I wonder who that is. And so Philip says, well, I know one sermon really well. It's the Jesus sermon. Oh, it just so happens it comes from your text. God has a knack for putting his people together at just the right moment with people who are ready to change. That leaves us with a couple of questions. The first question is a personal question. That is, what changes am I resisting? For those of us who are already believers, we put our faith in Jesus. And so if you want to talk about it as an earthquake, we've had that earthquake moment. We've had that night where we said, yes, I believe. Yes, I want to be baptized. Yes, I want to follow the Lord. And we have rejoiced and we have believed in God. But there are aftershocks of that initial earthquake where we have to keep making those changes. We have recalibrations that need to be done so that we can make sure that we continue to follow the Lord. And so I ask you tonight, do you have sins that need to be addressed in your life? 
Do you have confessions that you need to make? Do you have teachings that you know you need to embrace, that you have resisted? Do you have people that you need to talk to? And you know you need to talk to, maybe to forgive them, maybe to ask forgiveness. And you know you need to. My suspicion is when I say that, each of us has something there that we know we need to do. But we resist and we hesitate. My question is, what will it take to tip you over into full obedience? Don't fight God. Jesus says to Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. It is hard to fight against God. It is a battle you will not win. Don't resist God. What will it take to tip you over? For those who are not yet believers, I ask, what will it take for you? Is it possible that some of your circumstances have shifted, have moved around? Some of the things in your life that are not what they once were. Maybe even something that has shifted so that you are here tonight or you are listening to this lesson right now and you have an opportunity because something is at work in your life. Will you respond to the call of God on your life? Like the jailer, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus. Like the jailer, you need to be baptized into Christ. Like the jailer, you need to change to follow him from now on. Don't fight God. How can we help you to do that? I'm not quite done, though. The second thing I want to ask is what people in my life is God bringing to the tipping point? I want you to think about this for yourself. How are the circumstances of people in my life shifting? What earthquakes do I see and the fallout that I'm beginning to see? What types of conversations am I having with people where people are beginning to express things that lead them toward a moment of change? Who is asking me to pray for them? Who is confiding things in me? Who is seeking my advice? We don't always know where those things are going to come from. We don't always see it coming, and especially we are bad judges of who's going to be ready for the gospel. So it seems to me that from a story like this, we need to be aware of the fact that God is bringing people toward him and he will use us. But our eyes need to be open. We tend to put people in boxes and assume that if someone has not obeyed the gospel, they won't. If they have resisted once, they will always resist. But we have learned tonight that people change. So what people are changing in my life? And if I see that work, how can I be God's man or woman on the ground? The person who is not about the glory for them. Paul and Silas don't do anything unique here. They just preach the gospel. They are just ready when the moment comes. How can I be ready when that moment comes? What questions can I answer for someone? What example can I set? What kind of audience can I earn? How am I preparing for those moments where the tipping point is about to happen? I asked earlier, what makes people change? And the answer is Jesus makes people change. We are followers of Jesus because he has changed our lives. All of us for the better because we have believed in him. And those changes continue. But we invite you to be changed by him tonight. And I want you to think very seriously about God's call to you. Is there a way you need to respond to that? We've talked about what you need to do to put your faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, to be baptized, buried with him, and have your sins forgiven, washed away. We would love nothing more than to help you do that. Can we help you tonight? Please come to the front as we stand and sing to encourage you.